Welcome back. This is section 12.1, which in your textbook is 11.4, on rotational inertia. If you remember inertia from Newton's first law, objects in motion tend to stay in motion in a straight line at, the, at a constant speed until acting upon by an external force. Objects at rest stay at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. You're going to see the same with rotational motion. When something goes in a circle, around and around and around in a circle, it tends to want to stay going around in a circle if it's moving, and it wants to stay not going around in a circle if it's not moving. And it's based upon the mass that's in it and the motion around the pivot, around the, the, the pivot point. We've already studied the um, momentum, which is a, the product of the mass times the velocity and how that momentum remains conserved before, say, a crash and after a crash. The same amount of mass times velocity you have at the beginning is the same thing that you have at the end. You're going to see that this extends to rotation. Rotation also works this way. So if you have something going around in a circle, the, the, the mass of that object times its velocity gives you a momentum that will continue even if you were to change somehow um, mass or velocity of, of the rotating object. So big idea here. The greater the rotational inertia, and this lesson will teach you what that is, the rotational inertia, the greater that is, the more difficult it is to change the rotational speed. So the more, the more inertia it has, if it's stopped, the harder it will be to get it to spin. If it's something is spinning, the harder it will be to stop it if it has greater rotational inertia. So back to Newton, inertia, remember, was a resistance to change in motion. So if it was stopped, it wants to stay stopped, it doesn't want to start. If it's starting, it doesn't want to stop. That's a resistance in change. So rotational inertia is a resistance to change in motion around that pivot. So as it's spinning, as it's going around in circles, it doesn't want to start moving if it's not, and it doesn't want to stop moving if, it, if it's moving. We've spoken before how that inertia requires a unbalanced force in order to get uh, motion to change. Well, it's the same thing here, but if you remember, when you have a, a motion, you need a torque. And a torque is going to be a force acting upon a, a lever arm. And a lever arm, remember, is something uh, 90 degrees to the force that's connected to the pivot, there's the fulcrum, that allows motion to actually occur in a circle. So in order to extend this, you have to have the idea that it will continue going around or not going around unless an, an unbalanced torque is applied to it. So it's the same as a force, but it's a force acting at a lever arm which is 90 degrees to that circle. If I'm throwing a baseball, okay, the, the um, and I have a mass, that baseball weighs something, I have to put a force on that baseball to get it to accelerate. Okay, so that means in order to make that mass move when it's stopped or stop when it's move, moving, I have to apply a force to it. The di there's a slight difference in rotational motion. It's the mass is involved, but the entire object is not moving as one piece, but it's rotating around a pivot point. That means that where the mass is located actually has something to do with whether or not it's going to, uh, to be easy to move or slow to move. So we're interested in this section to find out where the mass is. Is the mass all concentrated at the middle? Is the mass um, far from the middle? Where a mass happens to be from where it's being rotated, the pivot point about wh which is being rotated, will have a lot to do with its, iner uh, its, inertia, its inertia or its rotational inertia. So here's an example. If, you, if the mass is very close to the middle, it's not hard to, to rotate an object. If the masses are far, you know, have, have a higher radius or higher from, uh, farther from the pivot point or from the fulcrum, it's difficult because it, it's resisting. That mass does not want to move, and so to move it back and forth would be much more uh, difficult. In the past section, we've looked at a tightrope walker.
and using a long pole to stabilize his center of gravity. Another thing that the pole does is it increases in his inertial rota uh, rotational inertia because the mass is not just the person, but the pole and the person. And some of the mass is located right at the middle where the person is, but a lot of the mass is located away from the person. And the farther that that mass is located away from the pivot point, which is his foot, will mean that it will be harder to move. The harder it is to move, the less likely you are to fall off of the wire. If you swing a baseball bat from the handle, from the, from the farthest, skinniest part of the bat, it takes, it's, the, the mass is farther away from your wrist. The mass of the baseball bat is farther away from your wrist, which means it takes longer to come up to speed. Now, once it comes up to speed, it's harder to slow it down. So if you were to hit a baseball when you are holding the bat way down at the end, you can really, it's harder to get the bat to swing, but if you can get it to swing, you've got lots of force to exert on the ball. If you want to swing the bat faster, you choke up on the bat. You make you you put your hands higher in the bat, which reduces the inertial the rotational inertia and makes it easier to swing the bat. Problem is, you have to be stronger to do that because you're not using the bat to hit the ball. You're using your muscles to hit the ball, and that would require more strength. But you can you can increase your speed. So if you're going to talk about pendulums. Why would a short pendulum go back and forth quickly, but a long pendulum would be slower? You've got another pivot here. The pivot is where it's attached. The attachment of the string is the pivot or the fulcrum. The mass is, is either closer to that fulcrum or farther from that fulcrum. The farther it is from the fulcrum, the harder it is to get it going fast. It's also, if you get it going fast, it's harder to stop it but you're gonna have a long period or a long uh, time for a, for a uh, weight to, to uh, go back and forth, pendulum, uh, pendulum to go back and forth, the longer the string. The shorter the string, you're gonna have a shorter time, and it's based upon rotational inertia. This concept of rotational inertia really extends to most of what you ever do. If you run, you are going to bend your elbows, you are gonna bend your knees. Because what that means is where it's pivoting at your hip or at your, uh, at your shoulder, it's closer to your body and it's not as hard to move. Something longer from your body is going to be harder to move. So if you were to run straight-legged, it would be much harder than if you were to run with bent knees and bent elbows. Because you are, it's harder to move that mass if it's farther away from the pivot point. We've already talked about a uh, center of mass as a point at which around all mass seems to, to be located. If you want to think of this mass as located at a certain distance from the pivot point or most of the mass or whatever part of the mass exists around the, the uh, radius, then suddenly now you've got a mathematical equation. You've got the rotational inertia, which we're going to call capital I, is going to be equal to, just like momentum, it's going to be equal to velocity times uh, the mass. But what you're gonna see is that that rotational inertia is based upon how far the mass is from the pivot point. The farther away it is, the higher the rotational inertia. So if, let's say, you are one meter from the pivot point, R would be one, one times one is one times mass, it would be one times the mass. If you're two meters from the pivot point, it would be two times two is four, and it would be four times the mass. So the farther away you are from wherever you're pivoting, the higher your rotational inertia is. Your rotational inertia, remember, is slower to make a mass move if it's stopped, but, but harder to make it stop if it's once it's moving. This is what you would do if you were taking a full physics class. You would have to know the formula for every type of object because wherever mass is located, you are going to have a different, a different um, amount of center of gravity away from wherever the, the pivot point is. So, for instance, a, a simple pendulum is going to be what we just looked at. Uh, rotational inertia I equals mass times square of radius. 
Same thing if you have a ring. If you think of a pendulum just going around and forming a ring, it's the same thing if it goes around its diameter. Uh, if you were to spin a ring sideways, like if you were to flip your wedding ring on, on the table and make it spin, or a coin, if you were to make a coin spin around its, its axis on, the, on a table, um, then you have a different configuration. If you have cylinders or, or um, sticks or balls or whatever, and whichever orientation that they're spinning would have a different mathematical formula. The main one that you want to look at is this. This is the kind of the default one of a rotational inertia, capital I, equals mass times the square of the radius. So final question, how does rotational inertia affect how easily the rotational speed of an object changes? The higher you, your rotational inertia is, which has a lot to do with where the mass is located, the higher the inertia, the harder it is to make something spin. The higher the inertia, the harder it is to stop something that's already spinning. The closer that the mass is located towards the pivot, the easier it would be, the lower the rotational inertia, the, high, the farther away from the pivot that the mass is concentrated, the higher the rotational inertia, I would, the capital I would be larger.